Hello there. This is the Untitled Show, Episode One: The Damned, nineteen seventy-six to nineteen seventy-eight. What happens when you mix the Stooges, the MC5, 60s psychedelia, a crooning vampire, and spill it into the late 70s UK, which is in the grips of a catastrophic economic recession? Turns out something damned good. Something damned, damned, damned good. I'm talking about seminal English punk band, The Damned. Now, for those of you not in the know, The Damned are an integral part of the emerging UK punk scene in the late 70s. I consider them part of a UK big three along with the Sex Pistols and The Clash. Now, some of you out there may argue the existence of a big four or a big five, adding groups like Buzzcocks, Generation X, the Rod Sex Ray Specs, Eddie and the Hot Rods, uh, Stiff Little Fingers, and many, many more. All of those bands were great. Not denying that. Billy Idol in particular had some great success, especially in the United States. A lot of people just think of him as just some 80s pop rock star, but he was actually part of that scene. However, my retort is this. The Sex Pistols, The Clash, and The Damned all talk trash about each other the most. This to me is evidence that they competed with each other. It was clear to those bands who their rival for Top Dog was. I mean, whether it was good-natured ball busting or true animosity in some cases, the bands themselves knew this was a triple threat match for the heavyweight title, so to speak. Those three bands were really the tip of the spear for what was coming out of the UK at that time. Everyone else just kind of follows in their wake, in my opinion. Now, some bands come close, but to me, there's really no comparison. And I know American thrash metal has their big four, and everybody likes to follow a pattern. We're human, after all, but never mind American thrash. This is UK punk rock, and I'm not going to shoehorn a fourth band in there just so I can say, oh, the big four. It's the big three, and I'm planting my flag on that hill. Now, The Damned were the first of the big three to release a single, actually the first punk band in the UK to ever release a single in general. It, that was a New Rose in the fall of 1976. The B-side was a Beatles cover of Help. Pretty decent cover. Uh, I heard in an interview that actually Captain Sensible purposely left his bass untuned for that recording just to make it sound uh, worse. <laughs> so that's one point for The Damned. They were the first UK punk band to tour the United States. That's another point for The Damned. They were the first of the big three to release a full-length album. Damn Damn Damned was released in February of 1977. The Clash's self-titled debut was in April. And bringing up the rear were the Sex Pistols, who released Nevermind the Bullocks in October and then imploded less than three months later. So that's three points for The Damned. Another thing that sets The Damned apart. The Sex Pistols and The Clash they kind of viewed themselves as harbingers of a social movement. In addition to being musicians, the Sex Pistols attacked UK society, especially the elites. They challenged values, social norms, and good taste. They were somewhat nihilistic in their outlook and seemed more into destroying what was. They were the mad dog let off the leash. Now, enter the Clash. The Clash would come in and would try to build something out of that. They really tried to mold this alienated working class youth into something more than the sum of its parts. Uh, it was rock and roll as a vehicle towards class consciousness. It's in their lyrics, it's in their image, it's a big part of their post-breakup solo careers. I mean, they wrote about a lot of other stuff too, but at their core, they're really a socio-political band, and uh, that's all right if you have a different opinion, but just know that you're wrong. Now, The Damned, they were the fun band. They were the party animals. They were about getting drunk, getting high, throwing bottles, starting fights, being punks. They wanted the kids to get rowdy. They weren't trying to get the kids to register to vote and vote labor or join some sort of revolution. They mocked that mentality and still do to this day to some extent. There would be the occasional political song on a lot of their records starting in the 1980s, but that really isn't who the damned are. They're not a political band. They have a wit and sense of humor. They didn't and still don't take themselves too seriously. Everything with a grain of salt, which is both refreshing and more down to earth in a way that is perhaps more punk rock than anything. And as their career went on through the decades, there were many lineup changes and they experimented with styles and sounds, but they never lost that sense of humor that made them great. They will probably never get that rock and roll Hall of Fame induction tribute like the other two members of the Big Three. 
And I'm not sure they care unless there's a big paycheck involved, which I don't believe there is. But this lack of recognition from the rock and roll establishment, for lack of a better word, may leave the band with a chip on its shoulder, particularly in the financial sphere. All that aside, in my eyes, they're a special group that will always get playtime on my stereo at home, in my car, and everywhere else. I bought my first damned album when I was 14, and I've been a huge fan ever since. I mark real hard for this band. I've lost count, but I would wager of all the live concerts I've been to of a particular band, the damned are up there. I've probably have seen them the most. They're at least a contender. I love every incarnation of the band. Yes, even the mid 80s to early 90s, roughly pirate shirt era, but we'll get to that later. So I thought it'd be fun to do a review of all their full length albums broken up into eras. Hopefully after listening to this, you'll want to go out and purchase one or two. And if you haven't seen them live before, once all this Corona bullshit is over, treat yourself. Go see them next time they're in the States. Buy a shirt, buy a record. So, with that out of the way, on to the first record. Early 1977, Damn Damn Damned, David Vanian on vocals, Brian James on guitar, Ray Burns, who I will refer to as Captain Sensible from now on, played the bass, and Chris Millar on drums. Chris, of course, is more famously known as Rat Scabies. Where to even begin? This record is a fucking cannon blast. As far as debuts go, this might be the best. This album, undeniably in the running for the greatest punk rock record ever made. Now, the meat and potatoes of this is Brian and Rat. They are the two standouts, and at this time in the band's history, they sort of steered the ship as far as musical direction goes. It's heavy, it's loud, it's fast, and just hits harder than anything else coming out of the scene at that time. I dare anybody to name a more bombastic debut album from a first-wave punk band. I don't think you can do it. This album has the feeling like everything is going to go off the rails and fall apart at any minute, but it holds together in 12 tracks of unbelievable fury. You got Neat Neat Neat, Fan Club, I Fall, Born to Kill, Stab Your Back, Feel the Pain, New Rose, Fish, Seer Tonight, one of the two, so messed up, and I feel all right, which is a cover of the Stooges 1970. Brian and Rat set out to make a Stooges record and just pushed the throttle all the way to the floor. Heavy Stooges influenced record. Basically, this album is a dissertation, the thesis. This is the way rock is supposed to be played. Cited source, Stooges song at the end. I mean, it's a blueprint on how to make a badass fucking album. It's vintage rock and roll on steroids. From the first note to the last chord, that guitar sound and drums are like a bump of the best cocaine. It's a shot of adrenaline. Everything a great punk rock record should be. Brian James is an undeniable talent on guitar, delivering searing blues riffs with anger and aggression. It's exhilarating. It's energizing. That guitar solo at the end of Born to Kill is screaming. In the entire album, Brian just shreds. He's a true punk rock guitar hero if I've ever heard one. Brian also wrote all the lyrics except for Stab Your Back, which was written by Rat. Rat just pounds the drums viciously with precision and fury that is only comparable to Phil Taylor from Motorhead. Yes, it's that good. Brian's lyrics, they're colorful and crass at the same time. He can get very descriptive and perhaps even esoteric conjuring images that do more to convey a feeling rather than a blunt statement. A good example of this is Feel the Pain, which is a dark and haunting ballad, for lack of a better word. Now, some of you of the Fast and Furious variety out there might talk some shit and hate on this track, but I love it. It's creepy, it's unique, and it's been one of my favorite cuts since day one. But Brian can 
also make a blunt statement when he wishes. I mean, take the track fish. It's about trying to find a clean whore in London. Not much room for interpretation there. Neat, neat, neat. Basically, Brian's attempt at starting a riot. Great fucking song. And then New Rose. More or less the damn signature song. I always thought that New Rose was about some cool chick that Brian was dating at the time. But in an interview I saw, he threw that theory out the window. Apparently, New Rose is a metaphor. I did not know this. The new rose that Brian was falling in love with in the song was the emerging punk rock scene that he was helping to create. He saw something special happening. This wasn't just a bunch of teenagers and 20-somethings acting out and being shitty. I mean, it was that. But he saw something fresh, vibrant, alive, something new. It was important to him, and he was falling in love. Kind of gives me a newfound respect for the song, and with that in mind... How perfect was it that New Rose was the first punk rock single in the UK? You can't make this up. It's magic. Vocally, the story goes that David Vanian had never sung a note in his life outside of the shower. But he gives a performance that is definitely above the rank of amateur. Without any training or experience, he he instinctively knew when to give it the gas and when to back off, giving the vocals dynamic range that is unique and remarkable for a punk rock record. Most punk singers just want to scream louder than the next guy. And as the band's career went on, he would continue to grow his baritone crooning style, and it would become a major part of the dam's overall sound. No one sounds like David Vanian, and that, my friends, is a hallmark of success. So where exactly does that leave Captain Sensible? Captain holds it down on bass. He is extremely airtight with the Rats Maniac drumming. His bass tone is aggressive, it's raw, but that's sort of par for the course for a record like this. Stiff Records producer Nick Lowe sort of just pressed record and let the band have at it. Production? What production? But hey, a good producer knows when to meddle in the recording and when to just let the music do the talking. And I believe Nick Lowe, whether by design or by accident, nailed this one. This album is raw, it's unpolished. I mean, in contrast with the Sex Pistols and the Clash, I mean, they, the Sex Pistols and the Clash had big label money, expensive producers and engineers recording their records. Stiff Records, on the other hand, they were the uh, up and comer. They were the indie label trying to make a lot out of nothing. They were trying to make music within their limitations. The tape and equipment they used was secondhand. The tape used to record was recycled over and over. And what you got was this saturated and distorted sound. And while this may not fly on a Yes or Genesis record, this is perfect for punk rock. This helps the Damned debut stand out from the debuts of their two rivals, particularly Nevermind the Bullocks, which is a pristine pop production. Uh, Bill Price, top-notch engineer. He would later go on and mix some of The Clash's best albums. But Damn Damn Damned was the record that I believe truly captured the ethos of punk in its raw and unpolished natural state. The recording is perfect, but I digress. Captain Sensible. At this time, Captain was more of a showman, the second frontman. He was the one on stage wearing ridiculous costumes, talking trash, starting fights. Story goes, he was looking to be the guitar player when he wanted to join the band, but... Hey, it was Brian's band. He already played guitar, so that was that. Here, Captain, here's a bass. Learn your part. But don't let this album fool you. Captain is a remarkable talent, and as we will see on future records, he brings a lot to the table as far as guitar playing is concerned. But why he didn't bring his unique flair to his bass playing, I don't know. Maybe Brian wouldn't let him. I mean, heaven forbid your bass player upstages you if you're a guitar hero, right? Maybe Captain viewed the bass as beneath him. Maybe Captain's philosophy on bass is to keep it out of the way of the guitar. But if that were true, then why do future Damned albums have intricate bass lines so high in the mix? It's an aspect I love, by the way. Look, I don't know. Either way, not a bad bass player. However, I find it ironic that such a huge personality would fade into the background on a record like this. Favorite track. 
hard to choose. I mean, this is all killer, no filler. But if I had to choose one, it would be neat, neat, neat. But every song is good. Even the Stooges cover, which is pretty straightforward as far as covers go, it's a body slam of a cover. I mean, it gives the original a run for its money. They outstooge the Stooges. Think about that. The weakest track, in my opinion, is probably Stab Your Back. I go back and forth on whether I like this song or not. When I like it, it's a snotty diatribe with fierce drumming that sort of did the 1980s skank beat hardcore punk thing before hardcore punk even existed. So I guess on a good day, you could call this song visionary. I can barely say that with a straight face. Perhaps I'm being too generous. On a bad day, it's a stupid fucking song. But at least it's short. So damn, damn, damned. If you're new to punk rock or just new to the damned in general, I can't recommend this album enough. Over 40 years old and it still holds up. I mean, it's better than most discographies of most rock bands. And these limey bastards got it right on the first try. So get out there and buy it. Racing lady says you ain't so cool. We've all heard of the sophomore slump, and since its release, Music for Pleasure has been a punk rock poster child for this phrase. This album is disliked by critics, ignored by fans, and the band themselves pretend like the record doesn't even exist. Of all the damn shows I've attended, I don't recall them playing a single song off this record. I admit that I didn't buy this album as a kid or even listen to it because I was told repeatedly by the already initiated that this was the bad one, that I shouldn't even waste my time. And like every good conforming nonconformist, I took everyone's word for it and probably so do a lot of record crate diggers to this very day. It's dead, it's buried, it's forgotten. So you're asking yourselves, is this album that fucking bad? My answer? Not at all. Are the songs the same quality of those on Damn Damn Damned? No. Not even close. We got Problem Child, Don't Cry Wolf, One Way Love, Politics, Stretcher Case, Idiot Box, You Take My Money, Alone, Your Eyes, Creep, You Can't Fool Me, You Know. And the CD reissue has the Help Beatles cover, Sick of Being Sick, and Sing Along as Scavies, which is basically just an instrumental to stab your back. The song that could have made it to the damn, damn, damned caliber tier is probably Problem Child, but Creep and Politics are decent songs. Politics in particular seems to me like a swipe at their overzealous social revolutionary contemporaries. It's like saying, hey kids, rock is supposed to be fun. Don't turn yourselves into cannon fodder for someone else's social war. Be your own person. I like that message. Are there some clunkers? Some filler? Absolutely. Idiot Box comes to mind. Your Eyes is a bore. Don't Cry Wolf was intended to be another sort of youth anthem, but just comes off as sophomoric. I mean, if it really was that good, why not kick your album off with that song? But no, Problem Child gets top billing for good reason. Lyrically, these songs just kind of meander and lie there. No electricity. But can you blame Brian James? Stiff Records put the pressure on for a sequel just months after their first release and expected the same quality material? Damn Damn Damned was Brian's best work accumulated over years of crafting. This album was written in a few months. So you're bound to have some stinkers on there. I mean, no one bats a thousand. I mean, most of the riffs are great. Brian, Rat, and Captain are still very, very tight. Vanian is great as always. But there's just a lack of intensity, a lack of urgency. It's not dirty. In the damn documentary, I believe it's called Don't You Wish That We Were Dead, there's this guy who has a great quote. His name escapes me, but he says something to the effect of, you have your whole life to write your first album. You only have six months to write your follow-up. Music for Pleasure is exhibit A, proving that bit of wisdom. So, not as good as the first, but certainly not the abomination that everyone is led to believe. So why all the fuss? Is it the ridiculous album art? I mean, you could barely make out the band's name. I believe the answer lies in mediocre songwriting, which we just covered, the production, and band infighting. We'll go on to the production. 
The story goes that the band intended to find the original Pink Floyd guitarist and songwriter Sid Barrett to produce the record. Seeing that poor old Sid was dealing with a mental breakdown and was a notorious recluse, they couldn't strike a deal. So instead, the record company went out and found Pink Floyd drummer Nick Mason. Now, let me preface this. I love me some Pink Floyd. Their records have incredible production, songwriting, cool stuff. Yeah, 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 we've all heard it. But the Damned wanted to get someone in the studio like Sid, who was going to push the record in that raw, 60s psychedelic direction. I mean, why else go for Sid in the first place? I mean, that is his sound. I mean, the Damned had already made that raw and raucous Stooges tribute album. Now they wanted to make a punk version of CMLE Play, Piper at the Gates of Dawn. Sadly, Nick Mason wasn't the man for the job. The raw and furious sound of their first record gives way to a sterile and flat sound. I mean, fuck, Mason barely even put any fucking reverb on that shit. The production is dry toast. I don't get it. What was he thinking? Either Nick Mason misunderstood what made a punk rock record good, or he just didn't give a shit. Now, perhaps some of the blame could be placed on the band as well. It's their record, after all. They heard the playbacks. They thought it was acceptable. Or they just didn't care. I mean, the way Mason tells it, he would ask the band if they wanted multiple takes of a track, and they'd just laugh him off. Like, why? I'm, look, I'm sorry. You are not going to make a good record with that kind of attitude. So maybe it was both parties. The band was on the skids in the midst of a breakup, apathetic, and Nick Mason just didn't have the desire or the force to sit these boys down and tell them to get their shit together which a producer has to do from time to time. I mean, money's on the line, people. Either way you slice it, the production lessens the impact of the songs, in my opinion. I mean, maybe this is why fans don't like it. I know it's a big sticking point for me. They needed a push from the producer, I believe, and they just didn't get it. But that's probably what they needed, because I hear songs like You Know, and I hear potential. Put effects on there, some delays, some tape editing tricks, something psychedelic, something interesting. This song is screaming for it, but it just kind of floats through the stereo speakers, hangs in the air, and then ends. And it's a shame. Begs the question, what would have Sid Barrett done had he been healthy enough to do this record? Would it have been better than the first? Maybe, maybe not. I mean, the songwriting wasn't there, but it definitely would have been more interesting. I guess we'll never know. Now, this album also doesn't get any recognition because the damn flat out don't like it. There aren't a lot of happy memories associated with this album. Excessive partying, clashing of egos, it was all taking its toll. Story goes that Brian refused to accept any material that interfered with his vision. They were going to be the second coming of the Stooges and MC5, and that was that. He threw Captain and Vanian a bone with one writing credit each, but... He wanted complete creative control, while Captain Rat and David were left to be sort of his backup band. It's all about the publishing credits. It's all about the money. Could have guessed, right? It should also be noted that a second guitarist was brought in to record this album, which I could imagine rubbed Captain the wrong way. I mean, he auditioned to be the damned guitarist. If you wanted a second guitarist, you already had one. Just hire a schmuck to play bass and you're off to the races, right? Well, Brian stepped over Captain and gave Lunatic Lou Edmonds the gig. Indicative of a clash of personalities and ego? I mean, I wasn't there, but I think so. I mean, it definitely seems like an awkward circumstance. And while we're on the subject, nothing against Lou as a person, prolific musician, has done a lot of great work, but what a waste of a second guitar player. I mean, Lou adds nothing to the music. Brian could have just overdubbed his guitar if he wanted a thicker and heavier sound. I mean, this is a waste of potential. There's no flavor, no harmony, no counterpoint, no nothing. It's just another missed opportunity with this album. Whatever the case was... The Damned would split up in February of 1978, just a mere three months after its release. This is one month after the Sex Pistols broke up on stage in San Francisco, and just like that, two of the big three were gone. 
Now, after the breakup, Brian James went on to form Lords of the New Church with members of Sham 69, the Dead Boys, and the Barracudas. Terry Chimes from The Clash had some brief involvement, so you could call this a punk rock supergroup, perhaps the first of its kind. The Lords of the New Church were a pretty cool band. Kind of expanded the scope of what Brian James was capable and willing to do creatively, which is kind of ironic considering how single-minded he appeared to be as leader of the damned. But hey, we all have room to grow and change, right? So Lords of the New Church, if you like moody, garagey, glammed up goth rock, check that out. Anyways, in summation, bad memories, mediocre songs, bruised egos, creative unfulfillment, and way too much partying. Band had to break up, but spoiler alert, the damned would return in 1979, and when they reformed for a comeback, they made sure this album and everything associated with it was downplayed, ignored, and buried. The band does not like this record thus perpetuating the idea that this album is the worst of the worst dog shit, when in reality, it's just not as good as what came before it or what would come after it. So Music for Pleasure, not a great album, but certainly not the worst thing I've ever heard. But we're led to believe it is because the damn don't like it. And they continually drag it through the mud in every interview where it's brought up. That's my theory anyway. Best track, without a doubt, Problem Child. Best single, funny lyrics, harnessed whatever was left of that energy they had on the first record, sort of a last gasp of that early damned intensity. Worst track, Idiot Box or Your Eyes, God Almighty, what a snooze fest. It's too bad they left sick of being sick to waste away on a B-side rather than replace Idiot Box or Your Eyes with that song. But the CD reissue has that, plus help, which is an improvement. So that ends the first chapter of the Damned Saga here. Next time, we will review roughly the records in the 1979 to 1984 era. And that will be some of the best material the band ever recorded. Looking forward to reviewing them, and thank you for listening.